This is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, June 6, 2024, getting close to the summer solstice. Um, and we have a call today that will be run by Kevin Jones with a lot of help from Klaus Mager. I am going to step out and uh, let you guys go. So thank you very much. Well, Jerry asked me, or I asked Jerry, and he said, okay, uh, could I uh, kick off a discussion about uh, what I think is pretty something pretty important, which is a uh, collective coordinated uh, bioregional climate change response. Uh, and um, I found donut economics as a good way to explain that to uh, different folks in that uh, I, we can point to some projects that address the social undershoot, uh, which is in the donut economics frame, you know, things that aren't working for economic justice and social reasons, uh, and there's not enough bottom, and then things that go out the top, which is our climate overshoot. And so uh, we have two projects that uh, we're actually packaging up in a donut economics um, ask for projects that they could highlight. And we decided to link them because you bring in two different kinds of thinkers. You know, the, uh, the thing we do around biodiversity is um, biomedicinals at scale because of particular regional uh, advantages we have here with the local college. Uh, around biomedicinals. And uh, we can also chart out our collective carbon sequestration and our uh, pinpoint local increase in biodiversity. You know, we can, we can sell our, our, our climate impact along with the products and it's turning gig workers into folks who could you know, drop their third job. That's, that's kind of our, so many of the folks building or doing medicinals here have, you know, uh, they're also a waitress and they're also a body worker or whatever. They move here for quality of life in the mountains and, and it's a healing place and, and you can make money healing. Uh, but so the, the simple, you know, metric of success of, of, of that fund we're, we're generating to invest in the the biomedicinals produced by this college that is right across the river from me, Warren Wilson, uh, they have this unique uh, guaranteed from seed biomedicinals. So, you know, it, these medicines weren't uh, produced at any harm to the environment. Whereas like with ginseng, they, they gouge the, the, the banks of the rivers and streams. Um, and um, they will support people learning how to plant these four things. One is something that used to grow here, a medicine that should grow again with climate change. And so they will support that. And then we're uh, giving the college a piece of the management fee of this fund, the watershed fund, uh, for providing the technical assistance to turn growers into people who know how to enter the market. Once we have real low levels of uh, you know, monetary success around that, we want to see people make enough money to, to drop a third job. I mean, this, you know, this is, some people will become economically independent here, but you know, we're, we're reducing the, all those folks who can drop a third job are a lot healthier and can do a lot of other things better. And then they can sell more product and maybe you know, even drop their second job. And we're going to build the market around that. But we're doing it with the college and the college the alums love the college, 10,000 acres, world-class forestry. Uh, and everybody loves it. And they will, uh, we hope that they will give to invest as a way to support the college, just like, you know, a credit card from the University of Georgia with a bulldog on it, you know, the football team makes a little money. So it'll be a, a we're going to look at it as a, a college with a lot of loyal alums who don't give to use giving to invest to create more biodiversity and measurable carbon sequestration as, as our first big place where we'll use it. Um, one other thing around uh, 
we've discovered that it, this this capital, this giving to invest capital, is really good uh, around actually getting Biden climate money unleashed in the community. So there's a local. Uh, group here, Hood Huggers, and they uh, been an urban food forest for a long time. They've got a big project to create a, you know, a meeting space, a cafeteria, music space, and um, they could get uh, geothermal and they could get solar, but they need 25,000 up front, which no, no group like that has. So they can talk to their donor and say, give us that money, but you'll get it back in a year when Biden uh, reimburses you. So we're finding that as a really interesting thing to unleash climate money in lots of small towns where the nonprofits don't have the 25,000 to, to create solar. So anyway, that, we're working on stuff like that and we're trying to figure out the, uh, the donor experience is gonna be different because this is giving to invest. And so small level givers, people at $250 will discover that you know in, in a year or two, they have $500 where if they give the same and and they didn't they didn't make it happen so uh, they'll be surprised by uh, recurring abundance and so we want to figure out how to help them work with that user experience and we want to give this away in a lot of ways we, we've just done a mashup and made it small and made it more accessible than anybody else where everybody else was trying to scale it and we said no this needs to be really small and so groups without a lot of money can get some money out uh you know, st small struggling environmental or justice nonprofits, but they have a little bit of a donor base can suddenly, you know, uh, supercharge their donor experience. So I think usually a, an innovation like this is given to people where the, the money doesn't really matter to them and they're just doing uh, charity as, as, as tax avoidance. Uh, but this is for folks who actually, you know, where the money really still matters to them. So that's the stuff I'm doing on that. And, uh, but I think, you know, the, there is also a question, could OGM be its own mutual aid society and, and uh, do, uh, you know, commitment vouchers and, and are, are ways that we could create a give, ask, mutual aid, something in between us. Uh, I've got some currency folks who know how to bring it in. And if Holochain really is about to be uh, widely accessible, it's uh, it's easier than you know uh, even going in with Serafu, which is on the Celo blockchain. But uh, I, I think you know Holochain is would be a thing to explore here. So that's that's just what I'm doing, and uh, you know none of it's worked out or figured out. But it, it, it you know it's promising moving forward and being invited to the table by folks that that uh, weren't paying much attention to us before. I mean, anybody comment, jump in or whatever. That's just what I had to say about what I'm doing. Well, I'll just say two things, Kevin. One, this is very, very cool. Um, and second, what would you like from us? Um, you know, what, the, so the question is, what can you do to be a, a create resilience around yourself where you are? <laughs> like I was, the most effective governance form I've seen to create thriving communities are networks of co-ops, like uh, the industrial commons in uh, Morgan, North Carolina, and then uh, Poder Emma here, which is a network of cooperatives by uh, immigrants who were afraid of being displaced. And they real and plus some of them had illegal status, so they couldn't own property as through an LLC because only one person could. So they did it through co-ops, and they created you know a, a financial powerhouse through deep relations of reciprocity between these co-ops and services. They've in, invested seven million in community directed. Uh, you know, economic development that, that helps other folks, you know, their, their clear focus is helping folks in trailer parks buy the land collectively underneath them so they won't be kicked out by gentrifying developers. And then they've got collective strength. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm just pointing out to things that I've seen that are working and I'm asking, you know, what, what else are people seeing that's working or, or what do you want to do? Or, or you know, uh, we, we, 
if the guy on the last call that, that, you know, had all that amazing AI talking back to himself and everything, he said, you know, people on OGM are aware of the meta crisis. So, you know, to me, local collective bioregional climate change response is, is the path forward that I think we can, we can do anywhere. So do people find that premise valid? And if so, what do you want to do about it? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Did it answer your question, Go? Um, it, it, it answers for starters, and it generates a bunch of others. And I can see one thing that OGM can do in addition to give to invest and replicating this model is to help you tell the story of this. So this is this sounds like neobook material real quick. Uh, to you know, to to distill your experiments and the ones you're aware of into I would love to do that little handbooks that could go wide and enable many more of these things to sprout. Yeah, because I've got it. You know, when I tell a story and people look confused, I add complexity, which doesn't usually clear things up for them. Uh, Jesse has raised her hand. Why don't she speak? Thanks, Kevin. Um, so I came in a little late when you were talking, but I think I got the gist of what you were saying of, about collective strength. And, um, I, and Jerry knows this well. I, I've probably brought this up multiple times. I don't know if you've heard me over the months to say, hey, how about we leverage this group's brilliance somehow to actually apply our intelligence to something of use, be it food systems or whatever, but on a localized basis. Um, use what model you're talking about or systems thinking or design thinking, whatever it is. I think the biggest thing, first of all, yes, I'm, I've been waiting for that. So you got someone on board, um, but really getting clear about the goal. We're all in a different localized version of our yeah. spaces, but one clear goal that's measurable and meaningful and, and then just do it, start small and then scale. And then we can go for other places. So that sounds great. Yeah. Uh, who was next there? Neil, I think, was next. Unmute. Nice to see everybody here. Uh, long time no see and <clears throat> interested to hear you're still looking for how can OGM do more than it currently <laughs> is, given its intelligence and collective wisdom. Uh, and given the situation on the clock of the world. I'm still concerned to hear only climate change when we're actually in global ecological overshoot, because climate change is one example of that. And I just wanted to bring that back to, I recognize the value of bioregional approaches, but we're actually in collapse. And so the collapse awareness that's required and the collapse acceptance that is required is actually at the level of each bioregion needing a functional ecosystem of collapse accepting partners that can operate across disciplines to redesign communities for greater resilience within bioregional carrying capacities that will change as our predicament bites. Now you might think that sounds familiar because that's actually on our webpage and I brought it to the group 18 months ago, probably two years ago, probably three years ago. Um, and so how do we get to this point of mutual recognition of our collective harms and damages, which is partly the measurement system, and how do we bring that forward into those people that are doing great work, like Kevin and others, that actually have uh, feet and roots in the ground, feet on the ground, roots in the ground, connections to community, raising the awareness so that the driver is not just the attraction towards, but the driver also away from those things which are causing harm. And that isn't going to happen while institutions are still focused on doing the wrong things righter within growth-based economies that are heading in the wrong direction and accelerating global overshoot. So we need awareness raising. Uh, I just wanted to add that I'm currently undertaking the Design School for Regenerat Regenerating Earth with Joe Brewer and co, and some people here might know of that. It might be worth connecting OGM with that group at some point, but I'm not necessarily the one to, to say that because uh, I haven't been close to this group for a while. I've seen a lot of the posts coming through, but he's been traveling from his current home base in Barachara in Colombia, up into Cascadia and other places across the US, activating networks of people exactly like the people you're talking about that have multiple pieces of these puzzles, trying to put them together. And what's often lacking is an external 
strange attractor that can actually help to build the coherence across those that have been doing the work for decades. And that it's very hard to get collaboration happening when all the patterns are already set. So my suggestion would be that you reach out to someone like Joe or others, and where are the places that that sort of energy could land? And how do you start to cross pollinate across? Because you've actually got a magnificent wisdom resource here, but I don't see, and forgive me if I'm wrong, I don't see much progress since the last time I was here, whenever that was. Um, and so firstly, it's enormous. Secondly, small scale things can work. Thirdly, you need to build alignment and coherence. And the way to do that is to have recognition of common threats and recognition of potential tailored common objectives. And I, I like the, the pieces that are coming together, but all of this has to fit together. Thanks, Neil. I in the islands it. of sanity. Thank, yeah. thank you. Stacy, you've had your hand up a while. Yes. If I could just interrupt for a second, Neil, could you please define collapse as you're articulating? Apologies, Stacy. Hmm. Very, very quickly. I know that Gil and others, and I see Gil's finger raised immediately. There are many that are still, I think, and forgive me for this, but sometimes you have to speak this, that are still trapped in hopium of a techno utopian or a social uh, process that's actually going to get us past these biophysical tipping points, which can no longer be ignored. The rate at which we are going through biophysical tipping points, and we haven't even noted all, we don't even know about where some of them are coming from, current ocean temperatures are off the charts, right? So when we know these things are happening, how do we start to recognize that? Collapse is a, an ongoing process. It's probably, we're at least 70 years into ongoing uh, uh, ecological overshoot. The donut is part of this process of recognizing that this is a deliberate social undershoot and willful global uh, overshoot. And it's not just about climate. And so it recognizes that if you want to use the whole spectrum uh, and it recognizes that these things will not be evenly distributed. They will hit poorer communities sooner. Uh, they will be climate uh, related uh, initial impacts, which will then increase uh, the rate at which economic systems collapse due to value chains and due to uh, the ongoing collapse of supply chains that actually are required. We have multi-food basket failures coming. They're actually in the pipeline. Uh, crops in Europe are having difficulty at the moment with both heat waves and floods uh, and or too cool for the blossoming and or too warm in the autumns. These things are happening as we speak. They're happening all across the US, all across uh, South America, all across Africa, all across Asia and all across Europe. Now, if that's not global, we've got a major, I've got a major issue, right? So in that context, what's going to collapse first is our uh, assumptions of how Can we, we stop actually live on our collapse for a while now. and let some other folks talk? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was asked to define it, but I think it, this is the enormity of it, right? I appreciate and, it. I think we have it. <laughs> gotcha. You muted you. yourself, Kevin. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, hey, you got muted. Are you, what, <laughs> <laughs> You're muted again, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not muted, though. Um, motivated by um, Marshall's presentation that Kevin referenced a couple of weeks ago, um, I sensed the energy that there was in the within members of the OGM group to use AI in problem solving. And so when I went to my 2045 call, which is an overlapping but not limited, you know, it's overlapping membership but not limited to, I brought up the idea of creating a solution solving playground. And uh, some people were interested in it. Uh, Michael Linton, who deals with economies, his issue was he wanted a hypothetical situation to work on. What I wanted to do was create a space where we could demonstrate an entry level, you know, a beginner's level entry approach to how people dealing with a local issue would go about solving their problem. So my thought was, well, maybe we could come up with the hypothetical characteristics of a place and maybe somebody like Klaus or Marshall could help show us how we would use AI to identify that place and use it as a starting point and take it from there. Um, so that, and I don't know if that's something that Mark had in mind when he came on and he was talking about a game or anything like that, 
but I just wanted to bring up that I think my sense from knowing the membership of OGM and other such places is that many of us like to do a lot of thinking and we can be useful if we're thinking out loud and if we actually had a problem small enough that we could actually solve. Now, Kevin's already done that. And when he comes in, he's already talking about things that have gone through those beginning stages that most people haven't been able to see. It would be nice if we could start at ground zero of something small, and then people could bring in their experiences elsewhere that may or may not work in that particular issue. Because I think to be able to demonstrate to a beginner mind how to approach a problem is what's really needed in society. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, that was great. Uh, Klaus was next in line. Was that true? Yeah, I think Pete, um, I, I think let's have Pete say first, and then I think maybe we can shift into into uh, a different uh, 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 in a different mode. Pete, why don't you go ahead first? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Klaus. Uh, uh, thanks, Kevin, for the update. Um, you're doing amazing and wonderful stuff, and I'm I'm super proud of of humans, uh, at least for a little bit, um, which is. Uh, which feels really good. <laughs> um, uh, I, I wanted to kind of make an observation. Uh, uh, Neil, I, I really appreciate what you said. And it also, it also illuminated, helped, helped illuminate something for me that I, the, the response that we're going to make um, is really multipolar. And Neil, I, I heard a, a bit of frustration in your voice. Um, and I, I, I understand completely where it's coming from. It's like, guys, this is the problem. It's not just this. Um, at the same time, I, I also know, and I think most of us probably know, the, the way that we get through this is by each of us making sure that we're working towards the right solution, but probably on something that we're called to that is might overlap some of uh, what the rest of us do and, and might not very much, right? So for me, I am called to help people communicate better together and work better together and figure out what each other are doing together. And that's my, that's my jam. So as much as um, I'm, I'm frankly a little jealous of, of Kevin um, uh, in his watershed in North Carolina, doing cool stuff with the bioregional and, and biomedicinal plants and stuff like that. It's not my calling. Um, I love to help Kevin when he's doing that and you know, the main thing that I do is uh, helping people connect and find each other and things like that, which in one sense seems really far away from what Kevin's doing, but I also think it dovetails really well. And so I think a challenge that we're going to have, um, Neil, you're also correct, I think, in saying that we haven't made a lot of progress in the, in the time since you've last been here. Um, in some ways, in some ways, I think we've made a ton of progress. Um, uh, I think we're making progress severally better than we are together. Um, and so one of our big challenges and one of the things I try to work on personally that I don't think everybody needs to work on, but how do we, how do we help each other go forward in our own um, multipolar uh, aligned quests? Um, you know, if we've got a, um, uh, if we've got a multipolar crisis, the, the, the response is going to be multipolar too. And how do we help, our, help each other move forward um, without frustrating ourselves by saying, uh, you know, dude, I don't know why you're doing that. You're off in a weird place. It's not my place. And I, I, let me tell you about, you know, the stuff that's really important to me. I think we have to figure out how to work together to say, uh, yay, Kevin, yay, Neil, um, yay, Klaus, you know, um, yay, Stacy. Um, and and work towards um, uh, the the poly solution to the poly crisis. Thanks. Could I take us back to community um, because we we really wanted to focus on community based uh, action and and Kevin has done you know, some amazing work at community. 
um, have been uh, working mostly uh, on on um, national issues, farm bill, you know, working with NGOs and so on. But I have recently started to focus on community and what is it that uh, you can do in, in, in your own community. And there are basically, um, I mean, huge concerns in every single community it was centered around poverty, homelessness, uh, people don't have food to eat, and this can only get aggravated you know, as we go forward into uh, into more uh, uh, you know, a crisis, as Neil was outlining it. I just wrote an article uh, in my last newsletter focusing on uh, uh, the impact of climate change around the globe and, and how this is already a reality. So... If I if I may just take ten minutes, uh, uh, Gil and Doug, to 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 set the stage you know, for for that, and let me take the screen for a moment, if I may. Um, and I've worked with a local group here. It's called Family Kitchen. Um, so Family Family Kitchen is an is a volunteer organization, totally funded uh, from within the community. They are serving some 20,000 meals a month, completely out of donations. When you, when you look at how they are funded, um, look at this list of donors here from, from within our community. So the, 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 the organization uh, has full-time staff. They have a million plus budget. Uh, Bend is a is a community of uh, just over hundred thousand people, um, and they are engaged with this. So I spent a little time with them. Uh, my son actually got me into it, and I went uh, and uh, went into the kitchen. And because you know, I started as a chef a long time ago, and uh, and and assisted there. So they have about seven people full time staff now. Um, they have probably a hundred volunteers who come there, show up and, and cook. And I was standing on the line, uh, you know, serving meals there. No one, no question asked anybody walking through the door gets a free meal. And then you see a grandpa coming in with an eight year old girl uh, because he doesn't have enough money to take her to a restaurant. He knows she didn't eat. So he takes her to this family kitchen to get a free meal. Uh, and, and and it just, I mean, you, you see things that just absolutely break your heart. So I did uh, sit down with the leadership team here last year um, because they were contemplating expansion plans. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I worked with them to, to, to lay out an organizational plan uh, to expand into Sisters and into Redmond. These are two smaller communities that look uh, adjacent to Bend. And so I gave them sort of an overflow, overview that says there's an urgent and long-term need to assist populations unable to, accept, to access nutritious and well-prepared food on a regular basis. You know, nutrition is healthcare. It is estimated that two-thirds of the U.S. healthcare cost is linked to a nutrient deficient diet. The US government spends $183 billion on nutritional assistance programs. Those $183 billion, over 70% go to Walmart, to Kroger, to Cisco, they go to the national chains, which sell highly processed foods and the regulatory frame of how this money is being dispersed states that you cannot serve a hot meal. So if you have a snap voucher you know, for, for people in poverty or WIC voucher, WIC is a program for women, infants, and children. So for children under the age of five, you can't buy a, a, a meal, right? So you're, you're wanting to sell vegetables to a person who may not even have a kitchen you know, or to a mother who has two jobs trying to uh, uh, you know, buy fresh vegetables and then cook that it's not going to work. So they're buying macaroni and cheese in a can, you know, full of sodium and, and full of chemicals and so on. So, so you, you get the idea. So I, wear, I was you know, walking them through some operational dynamics, 
you know, consolidate procurement, centralized skilled labor, investments in infrastructure, and then I gave them sizing assumptions and all that stuff. But the 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 most important part here was uh, the base of pyramid economy. There's an economic theory, you know, that says base of pyramid. What is it and why is it important? And when you look at that, the the main arguments that uh, the, this professor who published this thing is making is that businesses. Uh, are really poorly equipped to deal with poverty. So when you look at something like Family Kitchen, um, volunteer supported, you know, with, with uh, uh, a, a very, very low cost uh, 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 overhead and so on, um, they have the capacity, you know, to, to, to stretch that money that the government is providing into into uh, you know, far more. So I had my wife was hosting uh, a nonprofit event here the other day in, in, in our home. They're making lavender bags for uh, cancer patients. Uh, and I, I had, we had 25 people in there and I cooked them a Lebanese uh, lentil soup you now with chicken if, for $25. So for $1 a person, I cooked them a nice lunch. Um, and it was completely satisfying. So when you when you take this kind of these kinds of skills in the organizational planning into the space of pyramid economy, you can do things that uh, that a, a business that needs to make a profit, like a, like a Walmart or a Coca, is simply not able to do. So so what we are working on now, and I'm I'm. Uh, uh, I'm super pleased uh, to say that I made a proposal to to Family Kitchen to say, why don't we try and and work on uh, becoming a, a a SNAP licensed dealer? Meaning, there's probably the wrong way to explain it, but meaning basically we can accept SNAP voucher from the government and redeem those against you know, a, a, a nutritionally sound meal. Um, and and they agreed to 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 go with this, and so we are going to start working in July on doing just that. So they they I, I just to note on that what he's describing is an easily replicable in, innovation, and that's what's really happening now. Everything that's happening didn't used to be this easy to replicate. A bunch of things are coming up that you can you can do this here, you can do this there. So just to point to this is where the state of innovation is go ahead Pa. sorry yeah so so i went and i actually developed this plan with ai i went to ai and i fed all the regulatory frame that is in existence with uh, around snap and around twig and all these these limitations i asked the ai go take a a, a run uh, what's happening around the country are there any uh, communities that have already engaged in serving uh, the finished meals uh, using SNAP money. And lo and behold, there are six communities around the country that already do that. So if we can, uh, if we can uh, take SNAP money into, into account, there is a program that's called WBUC, where local communities take uh, their donations and double the value of, of the SNAP voucher, doubling the purchasing power of it. We can actually create a local currency. This is why I'm excited to work with Kevin because he knows how to do that stuff. Um, where we can create a local currency by taking local donations, amplify them with government money, and then put purchasing power into the hands of the user. Meaning that you know, if you have a mother who, is, who has a big voucher, you give her an opportunity to take that money to a place where it has the most value for her nutrient sound and, and, and rich food. So 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 in other words, we we need to organize the base of pyramid economy. We need to help them get structured because they can't do it on their own. You simply don't have the business know-how uh, uh, in 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 that group. And that can only work from within a nonprofit frame. Now you cannot there is no business. But when you think about $182 billion floating into the economy, which is now a profit center, then the, the second largest uh, 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 
line item that is being redeemed for these vouchers is sodas, you know, sugary sodas. You know, and, and the industry is fighting like crazy to prevent a restriction on what you can buy with these with these vouchers. So anyway, there, there are there are ways to engage locally. Right. And two critical things is is uh, housing, right? Because uh, we, we have to find some solution for for people who are sleeping in the streets. There are two million children in the United States of America homeless, you now sleeping in cars, sleeping under bridges. And then the other one is nutrition, where we have to find a way. To, to feed people with dignity you know, and, and with, with nutritionally sound foods. What we're doing is so embarrassing as a nation. You know, we should be ashamed looking at, in the mirror with, with, what, uh, with what having 40 million people, 42 million people on food stamps. That's, that's sort of where I'm, where I'm coming from. And Great. Can the, you close it up, Klaus? We've got several other people who want to be talking. Absolutely. I just want to say that the, the, the resonance in the community is amazing. You know, there are so many people who want to help and want to want to assist with this. They just don't know how to how to get engaged and how to get started. I, I put a thing on uh, Will Ruddick out there uh, in the chat, which is a, a picture of a, the easiest kind of currency to, to do something with uh, mutual commitment vouchers. Anyway, he's, he's my guide. Uh, Gil was next, I think. Yeah, from a while back. Um, um, let me see if I can get back to there. So first of all, Kevin, thank you so much for what you shared. Uh, it's really inspiring and very, very clear uh, and also clearly replicable. And um, Neil, did you just, oh, Neil, Neil, there you are. Thank you for yours. That was, I, I, I think the most cogent, for me, the most cogent I've heard you lay out your story. And I really appreciate it. It's right on point. So thank you for that. Um, and, um, one of the many things that resonates for me from that is the reminder that climate change is just kind of a flag for what is global ecological overshoot. You uh, tell it enough, eventually you start to make a little bit of sense, you know? Well, you, you you get better and better at the poetry, you know, and the deliberate social undershoot, I think, is a really important addition to that to that meme. So thank you for all that. Um, Stacy, back to what you were saying about using AI in problem solving. I have issues with the phrase problem solving in both the words problem and solving, but that's not the point here. The point is that um, if we're going to use AI, we need to use it in a very specific place. We don't need it to use it to find a place to do stuff. The place, as Kevin is saying, is any place. Any place has these issues and these opportunities. So I think we need to be really thoughtful about what, what prompts we put to the AI um, it could be to help us find lots of other things that are like this around the world, different, you know, different, different versions of this same kind of play. It could be to help us distill the principles of how to, how to help communities assess what their opportunities are, identify how to move, construct the kind of tools that Kevin and Klaus have been talking about. You know, I heard, you know, identifying local resources, the give to invest model, uh, investing in ways that build regenerative capacity, both ecologically and economically and humanly and socially, uh, you know, uh, 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 ways of suggesting applications that guide people through this exploration when Kevin's not in the room. Uh, I love the phrase, Kevin, easily replicable innovation. So I think there's ways that, that you know, judiciously applied AI can help um, 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 harvest and distill and propagate and scale uh, the kind of stuff we're talking about here in ways that lets other yeah. communities do it easily. I meant exactly the way Klaus described using it when he wanted to find out the SNAP requirements. Yeah. Just, yeah. just being able to visualize it happening. Well, and to be able to do, you know, it, 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 Klaus is a great example of using this as a really powerful research yes. system. This would take a team of graduate students months to get that map of the SNAP program spending and so forth. So, you know, um, um, so I, for me, this stuff is, is not artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence. Where do we apply it to help us do things that we can't do as efficiently so that we can focus on the things that we do as human beings with each other? So yeah, great stuff today. Uh, Stuart, the way I, I'm seeing it, it looks like Stuart, Doug, Jesse, and Joe, 
and uh, Jose, if if unless somebody needs to go quickly, if they have to leave or anything. Okay, Stuart, looks like you're next. Yeah, that. cool. I'll be I'll be quick. <clears throat> I just wanted to punctuate something that I think is is real important for us to keep in mind, um, in terms of big picture. Um, about 20 years ago, in a book called "Creating the War a World That Works for All," Sharif Abdullah said. A big problem is that everybody thinks they have the answer. <laughs> and in truth, everybody has a piece of the answer. And I think we've seen that here so far today. So, um, and as I was thinking about before I was saying something, you know, what popped up in my mind is that this is like a, a new industry, <laughs> a new industry, you know, let's save the earth. And it's kind of shaking out and discovering and finding its way. That being said, I think that one of the one of the the missing pieces is to coordinate all of the extraordinary efforts that are going on and starting to bubble up. Um, so whether we leave that as an emergent phenomenon in some way, people finding each other, um, or uh, we try to coordinate and help in that coordination, and you know perhaps AI would be a a great resource um, to do that. Um, I know. just want to point out that there are three steps toward this, uh, and uh, coordination is third. There's discovery, who's doing what, and then there's one-off cooperations that make sense and are easy. And then coordination is where systems uh, and connections are automated, where like exchanges are and train tracks. So coordination is, a lot of people say coordination and they mean Figure out who's doing what, who who you can cooperate with. I just want to point that out. That I often hear coordination coordination shouldn't shouldn't raise its head at this stage. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 thinking. I always think of collaboration because that's the work I do, and that's right. That's collaboration correct. is not coordinated. Correct. Okay, but they're both they're both critical pieces of the puzzle. I just wanted to drop that that thought in. So. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. So here is uh, my piece. Uh, I think that is somewhat conceptual. Most photographs of regenerative agricultural projects and other uh, things that are on the progressive side show photographs of lots of plants but they're striking that there's no people in those photographs. Uh, our projects to be successful have to include workers and consumers. And the way to get there is to not marginalize the housing and the living community separate from the uh, growing of plants, but to bring them together into the same space. Uh, I think that creates aesthetic communities that are fun for children and older people. Uh, it's a better motive if we can show how the projects are feeding people and growing people at the same time. So that's really my point. take on it. Thanks. Thanks, Doug, and thanks for being concise. Jesse, you're up to say whatever you need. Ah, Jesse, up. So thanks, Kevin. Um, so Klaus, and I, I, you're taking on a lot when you when when you even speak about two million homelessness and uh, you know, people being homeless and, and it's, and you're coming up with a creative solution to a SNAP program. It's, what I'm noticing also is that there's so many people trying to solve the world problems without localizing efforts. And, but I also, <laughs> not but, and I just want to make sure that we're able to measure success. And that's why localized actions are really helpful and important and but we need to get clear on what problem it, it is that we're just, that we're working on and you know i love the idea of there is looking at problems and solutions and defining what that is but what i'm noticing is we can get really really efficient at working on something like delivering meals to families but we're not being effective we so I don't know what the vision is to deliver meals, you know, for, for you know, or to give nutrition to people um, through meals, but is that the right solution 
I don't know, but we're, I think we really do need to, to create the space. So we, we talk about that to really get clear about the vision and the, and the solution where, I mean, the, the problem before we get into solutions, because we can easily spend a lot of time being efficient on the wrong thing. So. Okay. Thanks. Being efficient on the wrong thing. Yes. Good point. Jose, I think you're next. Thanks, Ken. Um, so this is this is really timely for us to have this conversation uh, because this past weekend um, I did a presentation the California Cooperative Conference. Um, Kevin, you pointed out co-ops might be uh, one of the answers, and I think I, I think they are. Um, though co-ops, I think, aren't um, quite ready to take on the challenge. And, uh, and so part of what we uh, presented was this uh, scaling up co-ops. How do we um, get co-ops not to just be insular because uh, many co-ops are about um, defending us as workers. And it's uh, about how, how do we as workers remain workers and independent from uh, the systems that be um, and our thinking is we don't want to insulate workers from the real world. We want to scale up workers to be co-owners and co-managers of organizations. And we want to scale up collaboration, not only at the um, cooperative level, but to scale it up across brands, across communities, and across ecosystems. And that's a different way of thinking about co-ops because typically co-ops have had sort of these different ways of, of identifying what a co-op is, right? Um, worker co-ops versus consumer co-ops versus um, co-ops in, in, in different ecosystems. And so part of what um, I think we as a community can do is really start looking at how do we collaborate at the local level what I like to, th to think of as the fringe, because we've talked about, it's about the people who are gonna be impacted first, uh, but also the people who are going to be able to move fastest and changing organizations, changing the government, changing large corporations is very, very difficult, but it's pretty quick to change people who are already looking for answers. Um, we had a, um, you know, Stuart was there, uh, we, we, Wound up doing another presentation on uh, on Saturday, Stuart, because uh, they gave us an invitation to do so, um, and um, and it was it was probably the best uh, attended and the best response from from the whole conference. It was um, it was amazing to see people are looking for these kinds of answers, um, and so how do we organize around? Providing these kinds of answers at a at a uh, a level that is um, global in scale and that can replicate peer to peer um, in a very easy easy mode. And so we're building some of the technologies behind that, open protocols and so forth to be able to do that. Uh, but it is about um, it is about peer. Is it it is about collaboration. And it is about local community and collaborative um, economies. It, it has to be about collaborative economies. So I think we're all touching on all of these things, um, but, but how do we come together to do this? I think we all have the answers, but we have them in our own areas of specialty. Let's bring them together. Thank yeah. you. Wow, great. I think Doug Bright, no, uh, Scott Mooring was next. Oh, hey, everyone. Uh, lots of really bright minds here, and I don't know what I can contribute to that, but I had an idea a couple days ago, and this is the only place where I feel like I could toss it out there. I don't know if it's helpful, but um, the question came to mind. My son had sent me a picture of my grandson cooking in the kitchen, and I thought, I wonder what would be different if the entire K through 12 curriculum was oriented and centered around food. 
And here's my thought, and it'll only take me about 30 seconds. Not one unit, not one semester, but the whole thing. So cooking is chemistry, math, aesthetics, cleanliness, nutrition, budgeting, empathy, community, creativity. Agriculture is environment, large systems, water management, seasonal planning, harvest tech, physical fitness, workers' rights, transportation, storage, hunting, fishing, foraging, food chains, or connection to the wild. You've got history, culture, spice trade, biology, botany, interior space design, ritual, family. And I thought, I wonder what things would look like if the entire K through 12 curriculum was oriented around food. I mean- What a great yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, so food, everything from food trucks to running a restaurant. Right. To, you know, my and so anyway, that's a, that's my idea. My kids went to a William Glasser school where they did stuff like that. You know, the first six weeks was about blue jeans, you know, and it's like cotton and weaving and math and history and power. And, you know, uh, you know, and then you go into, obviously you go to the, the recent unpleasantness in the U.S. where some people were enslaved to cause uh, cotton to go up. And uh, anyway, so it, it was it was really pretty interesting. Uh, and how, you couldn't get that far into justice in Mississippi on cotton, but you could get uh, tell everything about Egypt, but not about you know what happened down the road. Anyway, that's that's really interesting. I, that kind of school actually makes sense. I think Mark Carranza was next, and then Doug Breitbart. Just there, there's a great TV series and book called Kitchen Chemistry. Uh, which picks up on the theme just mentioned. I think Klaus was next, or Klaus still has his hand. Okay, yeah, yeah I'll figure that out better than me. Go I ahead, Klaus. It was Doug, Klaus, Klaus, and Mark. Zoom, Kevin, <laughs> Zoom stacks up the hands in the order that they were raised. So just, oh, really? Okay, so then Doug... Just read off, the, just read off the top of your screen. Don't read off the top of my screen? No, do read off the top of your screen. Okay, well, it says Doug, then there. Klaus, then Mark. You're muted, Doug. <laughs> You're muted, Doug. I wanted to pick up on, on <clears throat> Jesse raising the question of feeding people, you know, but is that the problem? And I think um, behind that question is the pull of the paradigm of abstraction and systems and intellectualization and the world we've been living. Um, I think feeding people, housing people, local, fundamental, meeting needs is sort of the foundational call to action. Because if somebody is fed and if somebody is housed and if they're safe, they're able to shift into contributing and participating and creating and collaborating. So it is about, you know, World Kitchen with, with what, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the chef who started it, but um, he sprang out of need in crisis circumstances to feed massive numbers of people. And I think um, if the focus can be where the rubber meets the road in meeting needs, on a local basis and the work Jose catalyzed with our collabs, which is to create a network to support local efforts, but to connect them all. So there's a common access to reference space and resource and help and guidance and partnerships. I think Anything rooted in meeting fundamental needs is a step in the right direction. And the alacrity of being able to adjust and deal with Neil's concern, which is we're past the tipping point, stuff's going to happen, stuff's coming. The, it's on a local basis that creating communities of action invest vested action and engagement of all in service to each other is where the ability to meet 
the speed of those changes and the impacts and effects of those changes and survive them has to be born. So even on the macro level of what's coming, it's on the local level that people coming together and collectively collaborating, co cooperating uh, to meet each other's needs and take care of each other, I think is, is where it's at. All the other academic inquiries about is that it or is that not it is completely um, uh, you know, fiddling on the deck of the Titanic. Yeah. Doug, can I respond to that? Sure. Um, love it. And you actually articulated what I'm trying to get to. You didn't say the mission was to, you know, deliver meals, but to help the community meet its needs. And that's where I'm trying to help people articulate what are they really going after? What is the target we're really going after? That's the how is to do this meal. And if we have better performance measures that really can help us see what in it in the community is working the most that helps us understand where we need to put our energy the most so right spot on yeah really good local asset mapping is key for sure klaus you're next according to the way they run it yeah yeah doc i'm actually totally resonating with what you were just saying um it's always difficult to to compact uh, this into a few words but we're basically looking at at the local community as a system and so when i look at what family kitchen is doing serving 20,000 meals a month without really understanding how they can incorporate this into local sourcing so you help local farmers you know get into get into this into this process here because that requires a planning process right because so if 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 we can get a family kitchen organized to the point that they can think ahead of what they are serving in six months from now then we can go to a farmer and say we need x amount of crops for you to raise for us we need to have x amount of farm animals so that we have a meat supply that can be done local so you can stimulate the local community and you keep that money floating inside and so the biggest uh, uh when, when i look at the federal government spending 182 billion dollars a year on nutritional assistance programs that money should really feed you know local communities because now you're starting to create jobs right if family kitchen can expand its operation, that means they can hire more people and they can pay for them, right? Because it's not, all, you can't just live on volunteer work because so, I mean, people need to make a living and it's a privilege to be able to volunteer and, and have enough time and be financially independent. So so that's, that's really the, the, the crux of it and I'm I'm just astounded how many volunteer organizations there are, even in my little community here. You know, people who raise you know, four hundred thousand dollars to clothe children that are too poor, and when they start their school, you know, they don't have shoes, they don't have uh, the, the clean shirt, and all this. So they they clothe children you now, so they can be going to school and not feel horrible. So there is so much uh, goodwill. In, in any community with people who really, really want to help and to provide some structure to this, you know, to help uh, uh, get this organized uh, so that you have this local economy. And this is the base of pyramid economy, you know, that needs, that needs help. Great, thank you. And I think Mark Carenza is next. Muted still. I have. Can you hear me? Sounds weird. Or somebody had their thing on. Okay. Anyway, I have some meta or methodological suggestions. First, slow down. S 
slowing down gives us time to free, reform our thoughts before speaking. Now, I do that by taking a piece of paper and when somebody else is writing, I am writing furiously to not have that feeling of, I gotta, I gotta communicate, I gotta communicate, I gotta tell somebody. And I'm not going to have, <laughs> uh, like, you know, I'm not going to have vocal stops in my process of mind to expression. That's the first thing. So patience, please. I'm going slow by intention because I want to not only have my inner processes of communication connecting to my outer processes of communication be clear and without emotional hijack. I just want to be slow. I want to notice what I'm feeling. I want to be mindful. If I say fascism, I want to be mindful of the knowledge that you as an audience have about fascists or beans or cheese. Slowly is the start. I'm a software developer. And, and this is like two. Um, in an object oriented program, there's a common example problem. That example problem is VHS rental. Now, one of the notions of creating a entity, an object in the system of the video rental store is say the actual VHS tape. And what one does <clears throat> is to be the tape. Okay, I'm the tape. What do I do? Where do I go? Where did I come from? What is my relationship to renting and coming back? What is my location? What is my name? What is my disposition? And the insight from trying to understand the substance structure and process connected to the VHS tape can be used for another object or sign or entity, the beam, for example. Let's quote, be the beam. And let's sit with the beam for a while. What does the bean want? Where is the bean going? Who needs the bean? What are the relationships that are inside the bean that make it the bean? What are the relationships from the bean to other beans? What is the relation to the beans to humans? What is the relationship of beans to the soil? Be the bean and just what is it to be? Number three, be the farmer. What does it feel like to be a farmer? I'm a farmer. What does it feel to not be a farmer? I'm not a farmer. And let's imagine that I think Morris White uh, there's there's a um, Stanford researcher who basically says we as a self 
have many subselves, or we can call them sub identities. So let's say Klaus has a sub identity as a farmer, and Kevin has a sub identity as a farmer. All right. There's a Klaus farmer, there's a Kevin farmer, farmer Klaus, farmer Kevin, whichever way the name feels best to you. Now, the operant and important notion in that statement is what does it feel like to be farmer Klaus? Or what does it feel like to be Klaus Farmer? They're different. If you say, I'm Klaus Farmer, that has a different feeling inside your body as I'm Farmer Klaus, right? Are we okay? So far. Um, questions left, yeah. But anyway, I'll try to end soon. Now. <laughs> Thanks for that expression of embodied mindfulness, Mark. That was really quite remarkable. And if you decide to, to to follow you the way you went, I think people would have probably gotten a lot out of it. I have seen in the chat that some people are confused and uh, I think that's also acceptable. That's fine. Confusion is generative. If I don't know something, that is a sign, a signal that this I have, this is something else I have to sit with. I have to name the confusion, say the confusion is about beans, and I have to put the bean for a while so that I understand the bean. And I not almost ever speed up my cognition and thinking. Yeah. What I've learned in trauma work is that rushing is a symptom of emotional dysregulation. And I encourage everybody to look up emotional dysregulation. So. Thanks, Mark. I, I will try a, to do two things again slowly, but to not, you know, ramble on. Let's imagine not Farmer Klaus, but, and not, Farmer Kevin, but the relationship between Farmer Klaus and Farmer Klaus, okay? That's a different entity than Farmer Klaus as an entity and Farmer Kevin as an entity. And that relationship between them is its separate feeling. It has a separate feeling. Is this relationship between Farmer Klaus and Farmer Kevin a good relationship? a relationship of understanding, a relationship of competition, what does that relationship feel like? So, Klaus has feelings, Kevin has feelings, but Klaus doesn't know Kevin's feelings, Kevin doesn't know Klaus's feelings, but there is a relationship from Klaus to Kevin. There is a relationship from Kevin to Klaus. There is also a mutual relationship between Klaus and Kevin as farmer or as bean, right? So what's the relationship between Klaus Bean and Kevin Bean? Now, oh, you know, we can, in our imaginations, take on these identities safely. We can say, I'm a bean, and we call that play. Now, we got to start winding it up to let some other people talk, uh, Mark. So let's just wind it up, okay? I'll be happy to do that. Let's play a game. How does Kevin Farmer help Klaus Farmer? And let's continue playing different games to heal the relationship so that the relationship, when I think about what the relationship between Klaus Farmer 
And Kevin Farmer is doesn't feel bad. It feels good. It's trusted. It it's a entity on its own that you can add things to, subtract things to. We can have a good relationship. We can have a bad relationship. We can have a relationship over time. We can have a relationship digitally um, over Zoom. We can have a relationship long distance. There are many aspects to that relationship that are just as complex. The relationship is as complex or more as Kevin or Klaus in whatever identities they pick. Thank you. Thank you. So I think Simon. Uh, Kevin, you muted. I, I would just say you've been Simon has been mute, uh, waiting quite a while. You're next. I can't hear Hello, you. We can't hear you. Yeah, can't hear you, Simon. Shimon. We can't hear you, Simon. It's not working. Yeah, I don't see a little red mic, but I don't, we don't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, well, thank you. It's been a while since I was one of these calls and I am gonna demonstrate uh, emotional dis dysregulation because I'm gonna speak pretty fast. Uh, I really resonate with what Klaus put together and I reviewed the document that he had on Google. It really coincides well with the project that I'm working on, which has to do with the first thousand days of life. What I have found, and I've sort of like adopted Danella Meadows concept of in order to make any change in complex systems, you have to change the paradigms. And I think that without changing the paradigms, we are going to keep trying to fix something with policies, ideas, and projects that's not necessarily going to make a difference. I come to this from healthcare, and my focus is on how do you create health in people as a foundational paradigm, as opposed to so much of what we focus on is pathology. So for example, poverty, why not only, why extend that and focus on what really makes people thrive? So one of the things that I've been doing, and actually I'm gonna go public with it soon. And again, I'm happy to see what Klaus is working on and some of the people in the group is looking at the first thousand days of life from the perspective of what are the core capabilities that people need to have to flourish in life and then work backwards. Where do we have to connect with those during the first thousand days of life? I'm not gonna expand too much on that, but one aspect of it is nutrition and it's nutrition in the mother before, well, I'm using the term mother, but preconception, during pregnancy, during the first thousand days of life, how do we maximize this? Chances of a child, any child, not necessarily just poor children flourishing. To that, we have to also have conversation, especially now with all the impending changes because of AI, climate, things of that kind, what are gonna be core capabilities that people are gonna need? So those are two questions that are basic to my work right now. One is what are the core capabilities? And the other one is what do we owe the new generation? The issue of nutrition is, as I said, very central. And I've been using a lot of AI in this case. One is to really analyze the research, what is required nutritionally for people to thrive at different parts of their essentially growth. The other part of it is looking locally, and I'm focusing locally here. What are the different organizations and within that ecosystem that are involved in addressing the whole picture of well being of newborns, as well as what is involved in terms of nutrition? 
one area, and I'm hoping to reach out to Klaus, you know, separate from this meeting, is to think about healthcare providers. Healthcare providers have started writing prescriptions for people for nutrition. And in certain places, like in Massachusetts, actually Medicare pays for that. So I really like the concept of thinking about locally being a provider for WIC or some of the other SNAP, whether it gets reauthorized, but also to think about how to get clinicians to prescribe healthy food and then making sure that within an organization or region, there is enough places where people can have healthy food where they can buy or access. Right. So far, there's a lot of you know food deserts. How can we deal with that? The other paradigm that I'm working on is what's called citizenism. How do you empower citizens to actually gain agency, which is another very central piece to how do you create healthy individuals and healthy communities? I'm not gonna go any further. Anyone else who's interested can reach me offline, but certainly this project that I'm initiating is gonna happen probably in July, we're launching it. And uh, to the point of having these conversations with beans and farmers and all this other stuff, AI is a really great tool. I've been having conversations using AI with fetuses, asking fetuses what they need in order to flourish. And some of the answers that I get are much more insightful than some philosophical, some scientific answers. So it's been really a lot of fun communicating with fetuses about their needs, about how they envision their future, and they're writing letters to their parents, to their community, very creative. Right, <clears throat> thanks. You're muted again, Kevin. Ramsey, could you kind of take the floor for a minute to talk about Holochain and maybe creditism and where you come from uh, with that new platform? Um, hi, everybody. It's nice to meet everybody here. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I don't want to talk too long about my project because um, it'd probably be better if you were you know, familiarized with stuff first with some of the material before. You know, I talk, but Holochain is just a, it's a distributed technology. It's a protocol. It's similar, I guess you can say, to like HTTP, where it allows um, you to have your own um, set of, you know, organizational tools to be able to have so, your own node, so to speak, so that you can connect various nodes to nodes and you, you have interoperability of information and data sharing. So it's just a, a better type of distributed ledger. Uh, technology than say Bitcoin or, or blockchain, excuse me. So that's really all that it is. Um, and I'm not a, a programmer particularly. Uh, so, um, but I have a lot of friends who are, and, so, and I know that they're very excited about that technology. And so that that's all that is. So it's not, it's not nothing more than that. Um, and in terms of my stuff, it's a little bit, you know, it's economics. It has to do with, you know, credit capital uh, and the relationship of, of you know, how the bills are distributed. And as you guys all know today, the game is very simple, right? All credit is based on our ability to trade capital. That's it. And so the only thing of value in the game is capital. And that's what we're seeing in the world today. You see us all constantly competing um, for capital. And then for those who win that game, they can share, they can you know, play it differently. Uh, and that's kind of what we're attempting to do here is you know, to help ameliorate those problems that we see uh, within the communities. What's so the overlap of, of social capital and credit at the way you're defining it? Um, um, what do you mean social capital? Well, you know, social capital is the non-monetary ties between folks that causes you to be able to get a babysitter without cash in, in order to, you, you reciprocate in some other way through a network, those sorts of things. All the support that isn't uh, doesn't show up in it as a dollar. So, well, I, mean, well, you're, I mean, again, these conversations would be best if you familiarize yourself with the, with the alternative because it is uh, different. The the 
distribution of the credit is direct to individuals based on participation and UBI. Um, so, you know, the, if you were trying to, if somebody is willing to, did you say babysit? If somebody's willing to babysit, then they would collect the credit automatically. You wouldn't have to pay that. That is valuable. Their participation in society, we recognize as a society, now we give them the credit directly. So essentially, what you have is a system where people are credited and now the world is in debt to them. And so that credit they are able to use to access any resource that the world has produced. And that's all it is. Versus today, where you have to, we have to credit our labor first in order to collect the value. So it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's just a, a different structure. It, one is one enables us to participate and how how we want, whereas the other one kind of you know controls us and dominates us, where we allow each other to control each other through the through the you know through the credit. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. Did somebody else follow that better than I did? Who can respond? <laughs> I'm sorry. I think there's a whole lot there. It just was too fast for me to grasp it. Um, I, I, I speak fast. Uh, I apologize. Um, yeah, like I said, idea I and if I don't you guys know. familiarize yeah, yourself with the material first, it would, this conversation would be much easier. Yeah. Ramsey, well, can you, room can for you, a follow up. Go ahead, somebody. Yeah, Ramsey, would you mind putting your mission in the chat? Um, I did put the uh, a link to the my. She, uh, she specifically my asked for a, a mission. What are your What are your um, goals? What are you trying to achieve? Yeah. What's your main goal in one sentence? If you want to put that in chat, that'd be great. We, um, I, I, what my intent for even asking that is: How can we help you? Okay. Sure. So the goal is an economic system that is in sync with reality, logic, and life empowering human potential on a lasting, regenerating, and embracing planet. Hmm. Yeah, we're going to be meet, meeting this afternoon. I would love to help you clear, yeah. clarify that goal. Thanks so, so much. That's the goal that I have written on the top of the um, on that latest uh, working document. And and Pete's posted a couple of links in the chat to your stuff. So thanks, okay. And I guess Klaus, maybe you can take us out. Uh... <laughs> the the um, what I'm really excited about, Ramsey, is the potential for developing local currencies. Um, because you want to concentrate all these donations that are coming in. People are, it's, it's just astounding how generous people are uh, in, in uh, giving to, to worthwhile causes. Um, but that money uh, is, is, first of all, it could be amplified, it could be directed you know, better to participating vendors and so on. So I think there is a lot of power in, in setting up a local currency system where you can take federal money, right, or grant money and put it in, uh, and then make that available to uh, people in need, so they can be they they can uh, be autonomous, right? Make autonomous decisions. I mean, guided but within frame and all of that. Um, but uh, uh, bundle this and then also make sure that it stays inside the community, that the money rolls inside the community. Uh, does anybody need to, Gil, do you want to close us out? We're, we're, we're getting close anyway. Well, yeah, let me close this out by way of opening us up, Kevin. Um, so this is a really rich call, but it's a, it's a peculiar one for me. We started out, um, with windows into two very specific on the ground innovations, what you're doing in North Carolina and Klaus, what you're doing in the Palouse. Um, and we talked some about how OGM can engage, cooperate, assist, help scale these projects, uh, which I was very interested in. Uh, and then we had a bunch of, my interpretation here only, uh, long adjacent, relevant and adjacent, but somewhat different discourses um, about things that people are doing and interested in, I'd kind of like to get back to that opening question of how can we, as this collected bunch of folks, what can we do to help, not so much help Kevin and Klaus, because I don't think you guys need our help so much, you're doing great, but how can we help leverage and scale the discoveries that you've been making 
and help them propagate, uh, you know, there's a place for slow and calm, like Mark was talking, and there's a place for fast and scaling, like um, Neil and others have been talking about. And I think there's some very powerful seeds here that I'd like to see scattered widely. And maybe, you know, given the time, maybe that's a topic for the next conversation, or maybe it's something uh, offline. Uh, but I think you've opened up some treasure here that I'd like us to dig into some more. And maybe if we can just close by reflecting on what it is we want to carry with us from this discussion, and just that we can reflect on what that is and then sign off whenever it makes sense to anybody. There have been gifts in this conversation. What are you taking? Well, since I've got the mic, I will take, um, you know, Kevin, you said at one point about discovery, cooperation, and coordination in that order. Uh, one of, you know, I mean, there, there are many jewels, but that was one of them for me. Yeah, that's from the economist who had the, uh, uh, use the sandwich to explain the firm. It's, uh, I didn't make it up. Mm -hmm. uh, the takeaway for me is is uh, how many of us are uh, putting boots on the ground and actually doing things, which is um, exciting, I think. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for collaboration uh, in all of these processes, but I don't think we should think about centralization or or uh, you know trying to trying to make it one thing um yeah let's 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 you know we've individually got the energy let's expend that energy in whatever areas we're working on and but very importantly let's collaborate between the work that we're doing because i think there's huge potential in that thank you and Stuart, you have your hand yeah, I just wanted to echo, I'll, I'll echo what, what Jose said and, and also the notion of um, it's too early to do anything centralized, if ever. Um, but there's just all kinds of great stuff percolating up. And I hear a wisdom and, um, and knowledge about stuff um, that's beyond my capability. So we need to really rely on each other. I mean, I hear so much expertise from people who have drilled down into specific areas. So let us continue to realize who's doing what <laughs> and to work with each other towards the greater ends that we're all um, interested in. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, everybody. This is this is uh, this was okay. <laughs> it, was, it was. Thank y'all. See you next time. Thank Bye -bye. you. It was much more than okay. <laughs> yeah.